Hegemonic Cycles and War One. This is the first of two lectures on Hegemonic Cycles and War. There is Hegemonic Cycles and War Two, which follows this. So make sure you see both lectures. Here you can see at the bottom a review of French soldiers by Louis XIV, and you can see in the top right corner a picture of the uh, John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, who defeated Louis XIV's troops at the Battle of Blenheim. So hegemonic cycles theory rejects balance of power because it has the underlying assumption that at all times you have a hegemon or a particularly powerful state that organizes the international system and leads the main coalition and that it's the decline of the hegemon that leads to challenging powers and it's the, the actions of those challenging powers that leads to large-scale war. Hegemonic cycles theory also rejects rational deterrence theory because disputes that occur in rivalries are longitudinal. They accumulate over time. So hegemonic cycles fits in with the enduring rivalries perspective of how disputes and crises are chained together. So we're going to survey in this lecture every major systemic war, the general wars, the world wars. And there's an essential puzzle here, which is why do world wars occur? General wars matter, as we saw earlier, because the 10 general wars that have been identified account for 90% of all the war deaths compared with the thousands of other interstate conflicts disputes in the period between 1494 and 2001. What we mean by general wars are wars which include most of the world's major powers defined as states that constitute at least 10% of the world's total power. Of course, it's a complicated definition. There are some different causes for general wars, and we're going to look at some of these causes in the context of hegemonic cycles. Some or all of these theories apply to some extent to all general wars. Now, there were wars before that, in some sense, could be described as world wars because they occurred on different geographic continents. But these were never coordinated. Chinese general Pan Chao and the Romans, the Roman military under Vespasian, were both engaged in a war against the Persians, led by Vologeses, at the same time, around 100 in the Common Era, 8100. But this attack was not coordinated. Here you can see a picture of Vespa Emperor Vespasian of the Roman Empire. The Chinese had been to Central Asia uh, at around this time. The Mongol conquest could also constitute a global war. The Mongols attacked simultaneously Egypt, the Dalmatian coast in the Adriatic, India. They conquered Java and Indonesia. They made a landing in Japan and they basically secured everything else in between. Yet those that opposed the Mongols were not particularly coordinated, although they might have sent embassies to each other. Uh, for example, the Crusaders cooperated with the Mongols against the Mamluks in Egypt. So there have been 10 general wars. There is some dispute of the identity of the 10 general or world wars. These wars are all dated from about AD 1500 because it was at this time that the Europeans came to dominate the world's oceans, far beyond the capacity of any non-European state to resist. And this rendered the European states invulnerable to foreign or non-European conquest. The Europeans were seeking to trade with Eastern Asia by bypassing the heavily taxed caravan routes dominated by the Muslim states, particularly the Turks. European capability was based on the convergence of heavy state financing and key technologies such as ocean-going ships, the compass, and various mechanical chronometers and mathematical means to navigate. The European states and their colonies continued to control 
to this day, though they may not forever. The U.S. and its European allies, plus the Russians, control about 90% of the world's naval military power. The Chinese and Japanese navies are the only significant non-European naval powers, plus maybe the Indian Navy. There were earlier large-scale uh, naval operations that occurred across continents. Chola, which is here, sent a fleet down to Java, the Indonesian Empire of Majapahit, and destroyed it in AD 1025. This here is a depiction of a ship from that era at the pyramid at Borobudur at the foot of Mount Merapi outside Yogyakarta in Java, which was when ja Zheng He, the Chinese eunuch admiral, led the Chinese fleet in its attempt to explore the world using naval power in the period 1405 and 1433. And these included landings and uh, basically kidnappings of, of hostages and the king in Sri Lanka. So it had a military aspect to it and it carried large numbers of soldiers for landings. But when China shifted to Neo-Confucianism and away from eunuchs towards family control of the bureaucracy, the attack on the eunuch uh, power structure led to the destruction of the ships. The ships were burned and further attempts to engage in naval exploration were abandoned. China has ever since regretted abandoning this program. It can be imagined that uh, if China had kept up its naval explorations, it would have been China, not Europe, that would have colonized Australia and North and South America. Fifty years after the Chinese ships were burned, Albuquerque showed up in the Indian Ocean and took over control of the oceans that last to this day. Here's a comparison of some of the Chinese ships compared to the ships that Columbus had that discovered North America. It should be qualified though that the Chinese ships were not very durable and didn't last very long, whereas some of the European ships of that age uh, would last almost a century. So a uh, size comparison is not the only issue that matters. There's other components of technology. And this is just to show that over time, geographies shift power. Now, the white band, which is indicated as ME, is Middle East. And it indicates that the, uh, about, about a quarter of the world's population lived in the Middle East around uh, 400 years before Christ, or 400 years before the Common Era. Uh, but over time, other regions became uh, more agricultural and their populations grew enormously. So we have a constant historical shifting uh, that is caused in an underlying fashion by economic and demographic forces. So this is the world when the Europeans took over, when Albuquerque entered the Indian Ocean and took control of the world's ocean surface. You have a fairly large population in Europe, India and China, and Japan, and smaller populations in the rest of the world. This was the political division. Europe was very divided, but you can see the Ming Empire. You can see the empire, Muslim uh, Sultanate of Delhi, uh, the Timurid Turks, the White Sheep Turks, the Mongols, and empires elsewhere. So this is the political map uh, into which uh, the world began in 1500. And, and this is where the story begins for these general wars. So the first war was the Italian Wars. This is the first systemic conflict and the first general war or world war. It went from 1494 to 1517. French Valois King Charles the Eighth invaded Italy and occupied Naples in a first step to reconquer Constantinople and Jerusalem. It provoked a counter coalition of the Maximilian I of the Holy Roman Empire in Germany, Spain, England, Venice, Milan, the Swiss, and Pope Alexander VI. Uh, 
and they eventually defeated the French. The Spanish commander was Gonzalo de Cordoba in Italy, and you can see him uh, depicted here. The soldiers fought with an arquebus, which is a form of hand cannon, which you can see uh, at the top of the page. And you had the introduction of the Spanish square, in which pikemen and arquebusiers were able to coordinate. This would later be uh, vulnerable to cannon. But at this time, and with this type of technology when cannon were not that mobile, the Spanish square dominated the battlefield. So here you have the Habsburg Empire in yellow, which united the territories of Spain, Austria, uh, the Netherlands, and what is today Belgium, and southern Italy, and made it a major power in Europe. And the Italian wars occurred in the top right map, and you can see here the different substates over which the Spanish and the French fought. Now on the world's oceans, the Genovese financed uh, the Portuguese uh, um, sponsored Vasco da Gama's discovery of the route to India in 1498. And the Spanish sponsored Columbus's discovery of the American mainland in 14, uh, 1490s. Uh, and this brought tremendous wealth and power to the Iberian states. Now the Genovese were obviously trying to outdo the Venetians who traded directly uh, with the Turks and the Arabs. Alfonso de Albuquerque was the uh, Portuguese sailor who led a small flotilla with small cannons and his conquest of Asian trade between 1507 and 1515 in which he defeated the African Muslim, Egyptian, Persian Indian and the Southeast Asian fleets and he seized control of world trade. Portuguese strategy as early as 1415 was to seize control of the slavery routes that were coming out of West and East Africa. And so they seized Sao Tome on the West African coast and Zanzibar in the East African coast and then the Indian Ocean and then the Maluka Islands where much of the spice trade um, uh, originated in the world. And through this they were able to dominate the world fiscally. Here you can see where the uh, fleets from Portugal went and you can see in the blue dots where they set up uh, bases. Here you can see the Spanish and Portuguese coastal empires and in the Americas where the Spanish landed in Mexico, uh, Central America and in the Andes. So there was for at least a century significant domination by the Spanish and Portuguese of global commerce and uh, there were nevertheless um, English, and in this case, Dutch raids that eroded it near the end of the century. Now, it's been a very peculiar phenomenon that at sea there's been a winner-take-all phenomenon in which the strongest naval state typically dominates almost all of the world's oceans at the same time. This has been because of the ease of movement across the world's oceans, and this has permitted rapid accumulation of domination of them by navies with only a slight technological advantage over their opponents. If one navy is only slightly more powerful than the other, It'll take it only a short amount of time to complete the conquest, after which it will dominate trade and make it difficult for its opponents to accumulate the resources in order to oppose it and build a navy. If you lose your navy and the trade that goes along with it, it could take you up to a hundred years to recover economically. The Chinese Bayang fleet was destroyed by the Japanese in 1895, and China did not begin rebuilding its fleet until the 1990s. And it wasn't until really 2000 and the 2010s that China had rebuilt a fleet that was respectively strong. Russia lost their fleet in 1905 to the Japanese and they didn't rebuild their fleet to a respectable strength until the 1970s. So each naval state imposes a system of free trade in which they use force to obtain permission to sell goods in the markets of other states. And because the state tends to be economically and financially stronger, it generally uh, sells these goods at an advantage. In 1842, the British East India Company attacked China and compelled it to cede Hong Kong and permit the British to sell goods within the Chinese market, which included textiles and opium. In 1868, Admiral Perry of the U.S. Navy threatened to shell Tokyo if the Japanese did not grant the U.S. trade access to the Japanese market. So we have our first theory, and this comes from 
AFK Organsky's Power Transition Theory. This is the principal hegemonic stability theory of war. So it unites uh, hegemonic stability theory and the phenomenon of war. Organsky conducted statistical tests and found that wars between the most powerful states of any period occur as the two states pass or are about to pass each other in total power. In other words, war happens when one of the states is in relative decline. In every power transition, there's a, a status quo state, which is the established power, which is in relative decline and which has an interest in preserving the current international order. There's also a challenger or revisionist state, which seeks to overturn the international system and defeat the status quo power. The challenger state is normally rising rapidly in power in comparison with the status quo states and wants therefore to take over the international system. Now in 1980, this study was updated and it was found that war starts when a challenger is stronger than the hegemon, but it tends to lose because it has a weaker coalition. So Germany grew very quickly and surpassed the English economy at the beginning of the 20th century. But Germany ultimately lost because it couldn't create a coalition uh, to resist uh, the British. Now a satisfied challenger state will inherit and not overturn the international system. After World War II, the English were too weak to be a global hegemon. They basically couldn't continue to dominate the system uh, after two world wars against Germany. The Americans were a challenger state. They wanted to replace England, but there was no war. The Americans inherited the system from the English because in general, the US was satisfied with the commercial structure that the British had set up. So here you would see the type of coalition structure between the dominant and the dissatisfied states, or the status quo power, the satisfied powers, and their challenger or revisionist states. So the dominant states on top. Most of the great powers and many of the middle powers and some of the small powers are associated with the dominant state. The dissatisfied states are led by a great power and some of the middle powers and the smaller powers. Now, one of the aspects of Organsky's theory is status inconsistency theory. This measures differences between national aspirations and the distribution of benefits. And it's been found that this distinction or this difference has been found to lead to war. So you can imagine a country like China today demanding more respect, particularly in the South China Sea, reclaiming uh, its status as a recipient of tribute in the several hundred kilometers around its borders. So war occurs during the power transition when a challenger state almost approximates the power level of the dominant status quo state and its allies. However, before the challenger state surpasses the status quo state, the status quo state typically begins a preventative war to defeat the challenger before the transition actually occurs. By this conception, we would expect a war started by the US against China. War is more likely in a power transition during abrupt downward or upward shifts in power changes. A rapid rise of power, like resulting from industrialization, which is what made the US powerful between say 1870 and 1910, leads to externalization of domestic dissatisfaction. So very often countries, when they're changing domestically, if they have some uh, desire to satisfy a domestic goal, they very often focus outward. Now outcomes vary. Sometimes the status quo state retains power and sometimes the challenger state dominates. So here you can see the red power, which is growing, but the orange state is growing more quickly. And so there's different opportunities for war, either at the red arrow, the status quo state can attack the challenger, or once the challenger has surpassed the status quo state, it can violently reorder the international system. Here you can see a power transition, and it actually lists various different uh, inflection points where war could occur between different states. 
you have a lower upper and you have the first and second inflection points. And there were 23 such power transition points occurring between 1815 and 1975. And these are grouped mostly in the crises and the disputes leading up to the First World War. Now take note, the status quo challenger distinction is not the same as the rational deterrence theory approach. The deterrence theory is far more about who attacks first, not who wants to change the system. Now here you can see a chart of great power and, gener and, and non-general uh, wars. These are wars involving the great powers. This is an exhaustive list of power transitions. It shows the name of the war, it shows the initiator, the target, and the outcome of the country that initiated the conflict. Here are some ongoing and historical power transitions. We can see the power of the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century and how they went into a steep decline and then effectively disintegrated. We can see the rise of China at the extreme right. We can see France, which is a middle power, then became a great power in the 1720s under Louis XIV, but then fell behind England. We can see the Netherlands and the rise of Sweden and the rise of Russia and the Soviet Union and of Prussia and Germany and of Japan and all the opportunities there are for these transitions leading to war. So what's the criticism? It was found in the Correlates of War data set that 30 states accounted for 70% of all MID initiation and were the targets in 60% of MIDs. Initiation and target correlations indicate that revisionist and status quo distinctions do not carry well in multiple incidents. So countries that initiate or are the target of disputes are not necessarily the, cha the uh, status quo states being attacked by the revisionist states. Rapid relative shifts increase the likelihood of war by 800 times. So power transition is an enormously powerful predictor of war. So we get to our second uh, general or systemic war. The War of Dutch Independence from 1585 to 1609. It involved three of the five great powers, so a majority of the great powers at the time. While most of Europe was involved in a Catholic Protestant civil war, the Dutch revolted against Spanish rule and in 1585 the British intervened on their behalf, provoking the unsuccessful Spanish Armada, the Spanish attempt to invade England. The end of the war crippled the Spanish attempt to dominate Europe and the world's oceans, and the Dutch emerged as challengers and ultimately took over uh, international shipping. Here you can see uh, Queen Elizabeth, and next to her is the uh, Spanish Armada in 1588. You can see on the map on the right the path the Spanish Armada took, and they were never able to achieve a landing on the British coast, and a great many ships were wrecked. Uh, you can actually see here uh, in the picture in 1603 a British ship firing cannon against a Spanish ship. You can see again the pike and musket squares used by the Spanish in the top left. You can see on the top right a map of Holland and of what is today uh, Belgium and the battleground uh, in which the uh, Dutch hid behind their dikes uh, and threatened to flood whenever the uh, Spanish captured territory. You can see on the left uh, the, the Spanish Arcbusier, and uh, at the, below you can see the prize. The Portuguese conquered Indonesia and the Spice Islands of the Moluccas that you can see in the uh, colors brown in the extreme um, right of the map. And then the Dutch took over during this period. They were able to uh, dominate the seas and then they basically excluded the Portuguese from Indonesia. And the Dutch were to control uh, Indonesia for several more centuries. So you can see in the left, the, in 1559, the pre-revolt Spanish Holland. And then in the map on the top right, you can see in uh, 1580, uh, Holland's become partially independent with the support of the English. You got the Huguenots in uh, France and the complex diplomacy of the period. And again, you can see some Spanish arquebusiers 
going to battle. These are, of course, Dutch merchants, and you can see the shift in overseas trade. The Dutch were predominant uh, in the 17th century, but then went into rapid decline in the 18th century, and the French and the English were able to dominate and replace the Dutch. So the second theory is long cycle theory and hegemonic wars. There are a set of theories grouped under the title of long cycle theories that seeks to explain the periodic dominance of the international system by the single most powerful state, which is termed a hegemon, and the transition of power from one hegemonic power to the next, typically occurs through or during a general or world war. The precise timing of these hegemonic states uh, is in perpetual scholarly dispute. But there's a general consensus on the broad outlines of the succession and its nature. The hegemonic cycle started with the rise of Europe in world affairs around AD 1500. The statistical evidence is that hegemonic wars follow the pattern of probing, adjusting, and then you have a hegemonic war. And you have 100 year cycles between 1494 and 1973. For hegemonic states, they invariably had preeminent naval power that was grounded in commercial and technological dominance. For example, today the US Navy is the largest in the world and probably strong enough to defeat every other Navy. As long as these states are dominant, they shape the structure of the international system, particularly commerce, typically pursuing free trade. But this free trade is predatorial. When the Dutch were free trading with England, they would dump goods on the English market, but then their navy would interfere with British merchants that tried to export British goods to other ports. But as these hegemons become overextended in defending their interests, where they divert money to build navies and not engage in commerce, they fall behind technologically to other states that are investing more in their economy. And ultimately, they fall behind commercially to a rising challenger. For example, the UK in the mid-1850s accounted for 58% of the world's economy. The British were an industrial powerhouse. They manufactured in England more than the rest of the world combined. But by 2006, the British had declined to only 2% of the world's economy. The British spent too much money on a large navy and not enough on research and development and reinvestment in new technologies. When Germany rose, they focus not on the iron industry like the English, but on steel and chemistry and surpassed the English economically and industrially with these new technologies. Because the dominant state obtains resource benefits by controlling the international system, they rarely make room for challengers. So the US has a very little interest in giving up its domination of the international financial institutions like the IMF or the World Bank or institutions of dialogue like the United Nations. If the US were to release what influence it has in those institutions, particularly the financial ones, the American dollar would become more vulnerable to the policies of other countries. And this would disadvantage the US. For a hegemon, trade and financial power in the form of banks matters more for maintaining naval dominance than natural resources, such as say wood. You can always buy natural resources. The British Navy got its wood from the Baltic, what is today Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Finland, and from New Brunswick, and from uh, parts of Asia. There's no large trees in England sufficient to build its large navy. So the British power was not based on natural resources, it was based on commerce and the ability to buy the resources they need. Now, if the challenger is a naval power, it defeats and takes over the empire of the preceding status quo naval power and becomes the new status quo naval power. We saw this with the Dutch, who supplanted both the Portuguese and the Spanish with their global naval power. Now, what do I mean by naval power? Well, most states in those days had very poor roads, and unless you were China, you didn't have a very large canal system, so almost every country in the world had coastal shipping. But if a state wanted to trade with its neighbor that was not simply up or down its coast, it would have to go into the open oceans. And there, the Portuguese controlled many of the global choke points. They could stop countries from going through the choke points, like, for example, 
uh, Cape Town in South Africa. So the Dutch were able to shape trade and stop trade where they didn't want it to happen. And ultimately the Dutch replaced the Spanish and the Portuguese as maritime hegemons. Now Modelski and Thompson have done a lot of research on naval power, particularly as it applies to hegemonic stability. For them, the challenger, if it's a land power, is defeated. But it so weakens the hegemonic state that another maritime power then inherits the position. So we think of the Anglo-Dutch defeat of France. This weakened Holland enough that the British then became the hegemon. The British defeat of Germany weakened England enough that the US then replaced the English by the middle of the 20th century. Now there's been significant disagreement on the actual general wars that were hegemonic wars. But the periods roughly coincide in the following waves. So 1494 to 1585, you've got the Portuguese and the Spanish, and we think of Spain as a naval power, but it wasn't. The Spanish actually didn't have a royal fleet. They had a few ships that carried um, bullion, gold and silver from South America, the mines of Potosi, uh, and you had ships that traded with China and came from Manila, but the Portuguese actually had a state fleet. In 1475, the Portuguese wiped out the Spanish fleet off the coast of West Africa, and it took centuries for the Spanish to rebuild their fleet. So Spain was a terrestrial power with some naval capacity, where Portugal was a truly global naval power. They were, uh, the Portuguese and Spanish were challenged by the Dutch uh, in the War of Dutch Independence. The Dutch replaced the Spanish and the Portuguese. The Dutch were then the hegemon for about a century. Uh, and then the English challenged them during the wars of Louis XIV. And England replaced the Dutch. The English then had a standoff against the French. The French were ultimately defeated. The British went from mercantilism to industrialization and so were able to survive for another century. And then they had to confront Germany and Japan in the First and Second World Wars, and then England was weakened economically. And then the US rose up. And then because of nuclear weapons, we had a Cold War, and ultimately the Soviet Union collapsed. And so what are we looking at now for the next challenger? Probably China, but why not India? So these are the um, disputes of which are hegemonic. And you can see here uh, long cycle global powers, Spain, Portugal, which is in the leftmost column. It tells us which of these countries are the great powers at what time. You've got Jack Levy's definition, which comes from his uh, book on his uh, statistical calculations of when are the great powers. And you see that Jack Levy excludes Portugal as a great power. And then you've got Singer and Small. Singer is J. David Singer, who founded the Correlates of War Project. And he has a different definition of what are the great powers. Of course, the Correlates of War is only from the post-Napoleonic period. This is a graph from the book called Sea Power and Global Politics by George Mandelsky and William Thompson. And they focus on naval power because they believe that it's the main instrument for hegemons that dominate the entire planet. So they focused on all aspects of naval warfare. For them, a global power is one that has at least 50% of oceanic naval power. Um, and you have concentration that goes to 50% of total power of a hegemon after a war. So after you have a major war, it's amazing how much concentration of power there is in one country's naval power. And then when that country loses its advantage and you have a deconcentration, this then leads to a systemic war because challengers rise up, build navies, and are able to take on that main country. Uh, Napoleon built a navy. He, he joined it together with the Spanish. And at the Battle of Trafalgar, the British inflicted a severe defeat. Uh, during uh, the industrialization of China, they, the Chinese built the Bayang fleet, but the Japanese destroyed it. And the Japanese then built up their own fleet in the 1890s, in the 1910s, the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. You have uh, the rise of uh, Germany, building a very large fleet in the lead up to World War I. In World War II, Germany didn't have a very powerful fleet. In, uh, and of course, in the First World War, uh, the, Jap the, the German fleet was destroyed uh, not destroyed, but damaged severely at the Battle of Jutland and then spent the rest of the war in port. And then ultimately in 1917, the sailors declared themselves socialist and went on strike. And that was the end of the uh, German fleet. Uh, 
In World War II, you had uh, several pocket battleships that were destroyed in individual engagements, like the Bismarck, the Scheer, the Tirpitz, the Gneisno, the Scharnhorst, uh, Prince Eugene, and uh, I think that was a cruiser. And then, um, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union built a fleet uh, consisting of several carriers and large fleets of submarines. And now China is building up their fleet. So fleets matter. And you can see in this chart uh, the rise and decline of concentration. So when the values are high, it indicates that a country has enormous naval power. And when it goes into decline, it, it indicates that there are challengers. And so uh, the bottom part, the bottom end of some of those um, lines go as low as 20%. So a challenger like England in, say, the beginning of World War II only had, uh, let's see, according to this chart, had about 30% of the world's naval power, with the rest of it being controlled by the US and Japan and other countries like Italy and Germany. So victory by a new hegemon brings a restructuring of the international system, which typically includes a new set of international institutions and structure of trade. So the UN is a product of US victory in World War II, and if China surpasses the US, we could expect the UN to be closed down and replaced with a Chinese institution, perhaps in Shanghai. World commerce did not exist until the European navies. Specifically, the Portuguese cleared the trade routes of hostile navies in the 16th century. You did have trade, but it was much more difficult to travel across the world as a merchant sailor. Uh, when the Portuguese uh, wiped out all the smaller fleets, it bas basically left uh, uh, commercial commerce to the control of the hegemons. Now, just because uh, the Portuguese controlled the oceans didn't free it for everyone. The Portuguese basically allowed those countries that were friendly to it to trade on its routes. So the command of the world's oceans has since passed to the Dutch, then the British, and now the U.S. Navy. In each period, free trade is preferentially established around the hegemonic power because it enjoys a temporary technological and commercial advantage. During Dutch he hegemony, British traders condemned free trade as a Dutch conspiracy to dominate world trade. But after the English surpassed the Dutch and took over domination of the world's oceans uh, and trade, it was the British who championed uh, free trade, and it was the Dutch who argued that free trade was a British conspiracy to dominate the world's economy and trade. Periods of peace have been periods of preponderance by a single hegemon, and periods of war have been periods of decline of that hegemon. And you think of the examples of Pax Britannica, when the British were dominant in the, in the late 19th century, the world was generally peaceful. There were very few wars, very few large systemic wars. But when Britain went into decline, the Germans built a fleet and the English could be challenged. The British pulled their fleet out of every ocean and concentrated the fleet in Europe just so they could deter the German fleet. And as a consequence, they lost control of the world's oceans. What would happen to the US, uh, rather to the United Nations, the World Bank, uh, and attempts at liberalizing world trade to the World Trade Organization if, if the U.S. were to go into sharp decline. Uh, some would argue that it would fail, since these are, in essence, institutions set up for America's benefit at the beginning of its period of hegemony at the end of the Second World War, and could not persist without it. Now look at the reader that I've uh, given you. There's an article by Jack Levy, and there are other theories of these long cycle theories that lead to war. There's Arnold Toynbee, famous historian, uh, Bill Thompson and George Medelsky, Robert Gilpin, Charles Doran, and Verenen. And they all have variations on the long cycle theory. Now here's our third systemic or general war. It's the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648. It included six of the seven of the world's great powers. The Thirty Years' War started as a Protestant Catholic civil war in Germany, but spread to include a Habsburg or Spanish-Austrian versus French attempt to dominate Europe. The Catholic side included Spain, Austria, and the Holy Roman Empire of Germany against the Protestant Germans, Sweden, and France. A third of Germany's population, eight million people, were killed, mostly through starvation. The war was also uh, concluded by the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia, which in political science is used to indicate the birth of modern sovereign states, as we understand them as having a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. In other words, people no longer gave their allegiance to the church and to a local potentate. They now gave it to the state. Who are you willing to die for? Are you willing to die for your king or are you willing to die for the pope? Here you can see uh, Cardinal Richelieu on the um, 
right, and Count Tilly, who is the Flemish Catholic leader on the left. So this is the map of Europe at the time, in 1634. And you can see that uh, you got England and France, and the Kingdom of Poland and the Russian Empire. Here's the world population at the time in 1648, huge increases in China, India, and Europe. This is the world situation map, and you can see the domination of the Americas and the coast of Africa by European commercial powers. This is the battlefield occurring within Germany during the Thirty Years' War. This is the Battle of Lutzen in 1632, and you can see Gustavus Adolphus, the Swedish leader on the uh, bottom center on the bottom left, and you can see Wallenstein, the Austrian leader on the bottom right. So here we have a third theory of general wars by Blaney. Now, Blaney argues that general wars are long and costly for a variety of reasons. Now, we spoke earlier about Blaney, but here we're examining the uh, extent of conflict and the constant of hegemonic conflicts. Now, Blaney argued that balancing phenomenon creates two evenly balanced sides that lead to a military stalemate. That's why general wars end up being so long and costly. Neutral states that could restrain a dispute from escalating to war all disappear because all the major powers take sides and there's no one left in the middle to deter conflict. One of the reasons the Soviet Union was concerned about invading Europe and fighting NATO was because of the strength of China. One third of the Soviet military was deployed in Siberia and in the east to deal with the threat of China. So the Soviet's military force was divided between two adversaries. So the Soviet Union would have to be significantly desperate or China would have to be very weak or distracted for the Soviet Union to have invaded Western Europe. Number two, general wars produce fighting on multiple fronts that makes victory on all fronts unlikely because you have efforts that are divided. Number three, settlement is difficult within and between the coalitions because of the multitude of interests that need to be coordinated. Normally, these allies settle on the lowest common denominator, which is the complete destruction of the enemy. But this goal is very often unattainable and it makes a war drag on for years. Number four, general wars eliminate the restraining effect of the threat of third party intervention, leading to a lack of restraint in the scale of war and in the type of weapons used. Chemical weapons used in World War I because Germany and the Allies had become desperate. The war was going on forever and seemingly every major power in Europe was involved. So there was no consequence to using chemical weapons. In World War II, the U.S. dropped nuclear weapons on Japan because there was no country to criticize the U.S. Every country in the world, every major power was either an ally of the U.S. or an enemy targeted by the U.S. Now here we're going to look at the fourth systemic conflict. These were the wars of Louis XIV between 1689 and 1700. It included six of the seven great powers. France's Louis XIV sought to dominate Europe, especially as France's population was by then the largest in Europe. France's economy did not require a colonial empire because it had very fertile soil and a lot of agricultural production. Louis XIV was opposed and eventually contained by the Dutch, Spanish, Austrians and the Germans and the English. The British during this period came to dominate the oceans and supersede the Dutch. The British and French began their wars over the control of India and North America. So at the top, uh, you can see the British soldiers at Blenheim. Uh, you can see at the bottom, French soldiers of Louis XIV training. And you can see the Duke of Marlborough, the British leader of the Austrian and the uh, Dutch forces and the English forces that, along with Prince Eugene, ultimately defeated Louis XIV's army. Here you can see a portrait of Louis XIV. And you can see on the top right the 1692 Battle of Stenkirk between the Dutch and the Spanish. And on the left you can see the map. And France had a very strong defensive system. But Louis XIV imagined that he could cross the Rhine, go into the Holy Roman Empire, would have stayed Germany, and eventually fight his way 
uh, to the Ottoman Empire and then get to Jerusalem. And it was seen by some English as sort of a, a, a totalitarian Catholic crusade, even though uh, Louis XIV was not particularly Catholic in the Spanish Reformation sense, or Counter-Reformation sense. Uh, here you have uh, the Duke of Marlborough at the Battle of Blenheim, which is in the sketch. And you can see on the top the, uh, the Siege of Tournai, which is also a sketch and shows the uh, Duke of Marlborough. This is one of the sieges that occurred during uh, one of uh, Marlborough's uh, campaigns against Louis XIV. This is the Duke of Marlborough at the Battle of uh, Mount Plaquette in 1709. You can see a painting of uh, Marlborough in the uh, bottom right. This is the French uh, warship La Couronne. And you can see in the top right Jean Colbert, who established the French Navy at the end of the 1600s. And on the bottom right is the UK's Royal Sovereign Warship in the late 1600s. And this is the Battle of La Hogue in 1692, in which an Anglo-Dutch fleet destroyed a French fleet. Now the Fifth Systemic War is the War of the Spanish Succession from 1701 to 1714. It included five of the six great powers. The French and Austrians clashed over succession in Spain. The English Dutch, Germans, Austrians, Prussians, and Portuguese opposed and eventually defeated France. The British expanded her empire during this period in North America. They secured Newfoundland and Acadia, essentially they captured what is today Nova Scotia, and they ethnically cleansed the French-speaking Acadians, many of whom went to Louisiana. The French leader here is depicted on the top right, Claude Louis Hector, who, is, who executed the war for uh, Louis XIV. You've got a Scottish soldier on the bottom left, and you've got North American Aboriginal negotiators in England in 1710. And the bottom central picture is the British Navy in the Caribbean in 1710. So this is the map of the period of the Spanish succession. You can see Spain united with the French and the various coalition efforts to break those two states apart. And here on the left, you can see an English buccaneer in the Caribbean. 1710. These are basically state-sponsored pirates. And on the right, you can see the British occupation of Menorca, a strategic island, today Spanish, in the uh, Mediterranean in 1713. 